Okay. Module number six. Funny enough, we have two more modules of lectures, and then we have a whole section of getting through more learning paths. So this chapter or this module covers some local host vulnerability items. As with the other things in Pen Test Plus, these are things that will show up, things that you should be aware of, and at very least know what it what it is, because you will be asked these questions in the Pen Test Plus exam. So, for example, knowing. Oh, of course, do the do I know this? Uh, but the, the first item is knowing what protocols are insecure. There are a lot of them. And most protocols that run our networks don't have security built in. For example, DNS, DHCP, FTP, SNMP, IMAP, POP3, all the Telnet, Cisco Smart Install. Knowing the protocols that are commonly used and have no security functions is important for the test. And of course, the obvious that those insecure protocols should not be used in any uh, to handle any uh, sensitive information. So you know, this is why you should have some encryption. You should use uh, more secure protocols, so on and so forth. But again, having an idea of the list of the, the insecure protocols is definitely important because you will see that where they'll tell you uh, the like those trick questions of which one of the following isn't a secure protocol or um, what, what are the the ways that you can secure FTP. You know, that's either FTPS or SFTP. And you don't have to remember all 1,024. It's just the common. And that's like a list of like 20 or less. The next item in the realm of local host vulnerabilities is privilege escalation. This is the process of elevating the level of authority of a compromised user or application. The main focus of the post exploitation phase is to maintain access to the compromised system and move around in the network while remaining undetected. This is achievable in a number of different ways. An attacker could compromise the system by logging in with a non-privileged account and go to another account that has greater authority. So this can be logging in as Omar in this example and elevating to an admin user because it just so happens that the admin user has a weak credential or uh, the hash was easily broken or uh, it's possible to pass the hash of an admin user. See, it happens quite often that IT decides to lock down user accounts, but forgets to lock down their own. They'll set up proper monitoring for regular users and then forget to do that on their own accounts because who else is gonna log in other than them as administrators? So in a lot of places, I, the, the accounts that IT uses, the ones that tend to have administrator privileges, are the ones that aren't necessarily watched over as much as the rest. 
So if an attacker is able to get one of those accounts, they'll be able to move about the network mostly undetected unless defense has properly protected themselves and properly set logging for everything, including their accounts, then uh, an attacker will be able to run around free and nobody would know. For Linux, a couple of items that you should be aware of are things like the SUID or SGID. It's similar to Windows where we have the administrator, the power user, the user, and the guest. You now we have similar stuff in the Unix world. And just the same way, you should test to see what program or what user can get higher level privilege. Of course, in the, in the realm of Unix, the user with the most permissions is root. And that tends to be the aim of an attacker is to become root or you utilize root to do whatever they want. In Linux, there is the SC Linux, a native tool that can help as it supports things like access control policies, has variables which users uh, can apply to applications and say this user can, act, can access this program or this user can access these resources uh, or set policies with granular control. In a similar way that Windows has the group policy, Linux, can, uh, Linux users or systems that have Linux on it, you can secure them with SE Linux. If SE Linux is not enabled, well, that just is a whole defense out of the way. Makes life easier for you to get through. In a lot of systems, I have seen this. It's a huge mistake to copy and paste root privileges and assign them to a user. The best practice, which doesn't mean it's the easiest, is that users should have specific rights listed to them rather than complete control. Because if we're using the example from prior, if a user called Omar has all privileges as root and an attacker logs in, because uh, Omar had a, a weak credential and does a, a quick check to see what they can do and they can do anything and everything, well, then it's easy to stop logging. It's easy to hide, easy to set persistence, and no one will be the wiser. So again, just because it's convenient doesn't mean it'll be secure. You really don't want to use root privileges everywhere. You want to be very specific, very targeted, and have more logging on any administrative level account. If you have a very little programming experience, this one is a little harder to understand. But essentially, the return to libc is an attack that starts with a buffer overflow where a subroutine return address is replaced by another one that's already present in memory. So instead of going where it should go, let's take it somewhere else. This will bypass or potentially bypass the non the no execute bit feature and allow the attacker to inject code. So a regular program goes into memory and it goes on in a certain way as a stack. So think of stacking pallets. It is possible 
to in that stack make a a call to a whole different place that's where it shouldn't go but because the program is already running in memory the no execute bit feature won't activate because it's a legitimate program so this is again this is tricking a regular non-threatening program to do something it shouldn't So the non-executable uh, bit prevents something like this return to libc attack because only the executable code is used. So rather than uh, running and then calling something that isn't part of the program to run, this would stop it. Because in this example, we have a program and suddenly we have this command to run bin sh. With the no execute bit on, the uh, CPU or the operating system would prevent another program from running on behalf of this one because it's not part of it. But if the operating system can be it can be uh, tricked, then this works. So there are things like uh, stack smashing, a technique that prevents or obstructs code execution exploitation because it will detect a corruption in the stack and potentially flush out any compromised segment. There's also ASCII armoring to prevent this where the address uh, or every system library will contain a null byte that inserts it in the first bytes of memory. This just prevents an attacker from placing code in those addresses and having that execute. This technique of ASCII armoring doesn't protect a system if the attacker finds ways to overflow any null bytes into the stack. A way around that, because you know this is all a big cat and mouse thing, is to use the address space layout randomization or ASLR technique, which mitigates the attack on 64 bit systems. When it is on, memory locations of functions are all random. ASLR isn't very effective in 32 bit systems because 16 bytes are available for randomization, and that can be figured out by brute force. But for 64-bit systems, ASLR is much more effective in taking pieces of a program, and instead of putting them next to each other, throwing them in, in random places in memory, so that if somebody tries to do this return to libc attack, it won't work because the program isn't all together in memory. Now let's talk a bit about Windows vulnerabilities, which there are lots of them. There is a way, it was patched, but there's still a way that uh, Active Directory group policy preferences allowed admins to set passwords through the group policy. Any user with basic read rights to the sysvol directory that sits in the domain controller, to the Windows domain controller, would be able to obtain the authentication key and crack it. There's also clear text passwords. Uh, if you have poked around your group policy, you will have noticed in the password section that there's an option to store passwords with reversible encryption. If you enable that, then it's much more easier to figure out what the password is. You really don't want that on.
I've mentioned Kerberos before. There is an attack for it. It's called Kerber Roasting. Uh, there is a tool that I have provided for you in the lecture notes with steps on how you can use it to extract, uh, to extract all the accounts, to get a ticket, to crack it, and add another a name into it and get higher level privileges. It works with Mimi Cats as well. So if you thought that the, the three step process or the three server process of, of Kerberos was secure and safe, well, not so much. Tools like Procdump, Mimikatz, and Volatility are totally able to look at memory, pull it out, and be able to dig through for passwords. Because Windows does that a lot. Anytime that you're logged into a Windows box, the hash of your password is in memory. So it just takes a tool like one of the three I mentioned, Procdump, Mimikatz, and Volatility, to pull it out from memory and then use it in past the hash attacks or, um, or cracking it with things like Hashcat, Rainbow Tables, you name it. Do remember that uh, every Windows machine has a security accounts manager, a SAM file that hides in system root uh, the system32 folder, the config folder, and the file name is just called SAM in capital letters. Windows has been using NTLM, the new technology land manager, for decades as their hash algorithm. It has been proven time and time again that it is vulnerable. Since the password hashes can't be reversed, past the hash can be used to authenticate. There are a lot of rainbow tables available to crack NTLM passwords. Uh, Hashcat is pretty effective against NTLM. With the right dictionary, you could crack quite the amount. Uh, so if you're using a Windows system, you are not as safe. You're, even if using a really complex password, there are quite the number of dictionaries that can help break. This is why protecting that local system is important because getting things like the SAM file, just a copy of the SAM file is more than enough to run to another system and break it and be able to use it. There is the dynamic link library hijacking. Dynamic link libraries, this is all still Windows. Dynamic link libraries are common components. They are loaded into applications when the application starts. Uh, DLLs or DILs interact with APIs and other operating system procedures. If you are successful in tampering with a system, in order to control which DIL and app will load, you may be able to insert a malicious DIL during the loading process to compromise the system. An application can decide the order of the directories to be searched for a DIL to load. Normally, the way a Windows application loads DILs to memory is the following. It starts with looking at the directory from where the app was loaded. If it sees nothing there, it goes to the current directory from wherever the user is working. If it doesn't find something there, then it goes to the system directory 
typically in the Windows System32 folder using a function called get system directory. If it doesn't find a dill there, it'll use the 16-bit system directory, which is the old school like DOS 9598 way. If that doesn't work, it goes to the Windows directory using the get Windows directory function. And if that doesn't work, then it goes to any directories that are listed in the path environment variable. So yes, it is completely possible to start up a program, put a malicious dill file in the directory where that program is. So the moment it runs, it will load that dill and now you've just weaponized in an Oculus program to do things it shouldn't do. But to get there, you got to get on the system and then inject the dill file in the place you want it, where you know it'll run. So while the first part might be a little harder, the second part's easier because this is Windows's nature. Um, two items regarding services. There are the unquoted service paths and the writable services. With the unquoted service paths, if an executable is enclosed in quotation marks, Windows will know where to find it. If not, Windows will try to locate and execute it inside every folder of this path until it finds the executable. An attacker is then uh, able to abuse the functionality to try to elevate privileges if the service is running under system, the user. A service is vulnerable if the path to the executable has a space in the file name or not wrapped in quotation marks. If you're on a Windows system, you should look at services.msc. It'll give you a list of all the background processes of your system. If you just so happen to find one that has that, uh, that whose file path is not quoted, know that that service is vulnerable to this exact thing that I'm talking about right now. The other way to exploiting these background processes or services is the ones that are writable. See, administrators often configure Windows services that run with system privileges, leading to a security problem as an attacker may obtain permission over the service or over the folder where the binary of the service is stored for both. If a background process is able to write to somewhere uh, that it typically shouldn't. If it has more permissions than just being a background process, that can be exploited. The print spooler should only be able to forward information to a printer. That is its existence. Yet it has been proven and it's been patched on how you can leverage the print spooler to get into Windows and wreak havoc. So those background processes that you depend on can be used against you. This is why you should double check them. Now with either OS family, you should always look at the file and folder permissions. No user should have full control of everything. That's, that's just not good practice. It opens the door. It's like having a door without a lock. Anybody can get in. And the data 
the information is the thing we're supposed to be protecting. So it shouldn't be accessible to everybody just because it's convenient. It should only be accessible to those who need access to it. And that's it. And I know group policy can be a pain. There is a lot of options within it, but do not use the default template for group policy just because it looks daunting. Attackers know that a lot of, of IT people don't spend the time going through group policy and enabling the proper settings in order to prevent a attacker from getting access to the network and then uh, going up in privileges or being able to, to move laterally by using other applications or things as silly as the print spooler to get deeper access. All that stuff can be fought back with some defensive measures through group policy. So I know it looks boring. I know it looks daunting, but you really should not use the default. You really should configure it yourself. Another host vulnerability is a key logger. I know that we've been working from home. So this question doesn't have as much weight as it used to, but it kind of does at home. If you are at a desktop, when was the last time you looked behind your computer? If it's been a while that you've looked behind your machine, you may not have realized if and when your cables were tampered with, if and when somebody connected a keylogger in the back where you typically don't see. When we all return back to being in office or just having a machine that's around where other people see it and use it, remember to always check the back. Always look at, at your peripherals and how they're connected to the system. Keyloggers can be a physical device that's really small, but goes right between the USB port, for example, and the actual keyboard's cable or adapter. You want to take a look. You want to ensure that your keyboard has not been tampered with. Keyloggers don't show up as, a, as another device. No operating system detects it because that's how they're built. Keyloggers are built to be stealthy. Keyboard loggers don't always exist in just a physical form. You also have in, for example, in the kernel as an API, as a hypervisor, as a form grabbing on the web, JavaScript based, or even memory injection. So it's not only looking at the physical device, it's also at what programs are running or what website you're on. Sketchy sites could have keyloggers on them. Schedule tests may be great for automating, like backups, but in Windows, Specifically, Windows uh, Task Scheduler bypasses the user access control. Since a lot of the, the tasks run with system privileges. 
making life just a little easier to get a uh, an attack in a persistent way with higher level privileges. Let me log into this machine. Let me set a scheduled task that at restart, this program runs and it'll run with system level or administrator level privileges. And it won't be stopped by the UAC. Malware and attackers are able to escape your sandbox. Sandboxes are not foolproof. Some software is sophisticated enough to do it on its own or detect that they are in a sandbox and prevent from running. The three, well, there's a number of them. But there, for example, uh, the one for mobile is jail, hence the term to jailbreak. Applications in mobile devices have a restricted file system namespace and rule-based execution that doesn't allow untrusted applications to run. But if you jailbreak your phone, then you're able to run anything. And that also means malware is able to run which is why it's usually not recommended to jailbreak your phone. There's also the rule-based execution using things like SE Linux or AppArmor in order to restrict uh, what when processes get started, if they can spawn any other application or prevent them from injecting code to a system and what programs they can read and write to the file system. Virtual machines are a great sandbox, but again, if you're dealing with malware that's sophisticated, it may not even run. So it'll make detecting and working with a lot harder. Some applications have their own sandbox, which can make life easier when working with malware. Uh, there's the secure computing mode or SecConf for Linux that uh, prevents the write, read, exit, and SIG return system calls from running within a sandbox. Web browsers are now getting really, really good at making sandboxes out of every site. HTML5 has an attribute, a sandbox attribute for iframes. Uh, any Java VMs run in its own little box. Adobe Reader can open up PDF files in sandboxes. And things like Microsoft Office also have a sandbox mode for any macros which tend to be a easy way for an attacker to launch code or inject code or just cause mayhem on a system. Well, talking about virtual machines, we also need to talk about containers. They are cool because they're small. They can be stacked together. They can be orchestrated together. They're very agile because they're so small. They only run a specific application and it's not really a full on VM. Of course, the problem with that becomes developers often pull Docker containers from community repositories without knowing what vulnerabilities exist. They're just trying to make a application run or trying to make something. So they pull things from the open source community and don't check it themselves to see, are there vulnerabilities in this, in this thing that I'm gonna use? They just see that it works, so they run with it. 
you as a security person can use that to see is, is the container that they downloaded vulnerable? Does it have, uh, does it have malware that is set to run? And what, what is it that they're using? Because it's very easy and it has happened where uh, malware authors will put their payloads into containers that are used by a lot of people. So they'll fetch the new update and just like that, they propagated their malware, piece of cake. In the lecture notes, I provided you a number of tools that will help you to look into the containers that you have and perform an asset and vulnerability management on them. Because again, you want to know what is on your network, what is being downloaded, what is being used. Those things could come back to bite you later if they are already compromised and being downloaded and used. This next section is not that long nor deep into the world of mobile device security. With Pentest Plus, you need to have a basic understanding. Uh, there are whole realms dedicated to Android and iOS security. But Pentest Plus just wants you to have a, a basic understanding, nothing, nothing too deep. Android is composed of different layers, as you see in this picture. At the lowest level in red, you see Android is based on a variation of the Linux kernel. On top of that is the hardware abstraction layer defining a standard interface for interacting with the physical hardware. You'll see several implementations that are packaged into shared library modules that the Android system calls when, when required, like when you tap on the app for your camera or a microphone or speakers. It is important to note that Android apps are usually written in Java and compiled in Dalvik bytecode. I have seen that on the test, that uh, Android apps are written in Java and compiled in Dalvik bytecode. Android apps do not have a direct access to hardware resources with each app running in a sandbox called the Android application sandbox. The Android runtime controls the maximum number of system resources allocated to applications. The process called Zygo starts up during Android initialization. This application is a base process that contains all the core libraries an application will need. Once it's launched, Zygo opens the socket called, uh, in dev socket Zygo and listens for connections from local clients. When it receives a connection, it forks a new process, which then loads and executes the app-specific code. Android does not implement user accounts the same way Unix does. The multi-user support of the Linux kernel extends to sandbox applications with a few exceptions, each app will run as though under a separate Linux user, isolating them from the rest of the operating system. Android creates unique IDs with the range of 10,000 to 19,999 with permissions added by group IDs. So things like accessing the camera, is a group ID, accessing the mic is a group ID, accessing GPS is another group ID. 
Android applications interact with system services through normal Java method calls that are translated to IPC calls to system services that are running in the background, like your network connectivity, your camera, your GPS, so on and so forth. The Android Package Kit, APK, file is an archive that contains the code and resources required to run the application it comes with. This file is identical to the original signed application from the developer. Typically, they're all stored in slash data app and then the package name. Uh, the, man, the Android manifest.xml has a number of useful information for every application. Each one has one. The Android application lifetime is controlled by the operating system. Android may kill a process when it's no longer necessary or when it needs to reclaim memory to run other applications. The decision to kill an app or not is primarily related to the state of the user's interaction with that process. Two tools that I would recommend if you want to get into the world of mobile device, which by the way, there's a lot of insecurities in mobile applications. Um, and again, this is its own realm that you could just, just uh, bury yourself into and be fine and have plenty of things to do. Uh, but two that I would recommend are Android Studio or Jenny Motion that'll help you perform detailed analysis of Android applications. Yeah, if you get into the world of mobile, pick one of the two because there's a lot to, to, to research and do. Now again, a little bit about iOS. iOS runs strictly on Apple mobile devices. Applications run in a restricted environment and are isolated from each other at the file system level. The applications are also significantly limited in the terms of system API accesses compared to Mac OS or any other operating system. Apple restricts and controls access to the applications that are allowed to run on iOS through the App Store. And uh, the Epic people have still not won that battle. iOS applications are isolated in sandboxes and mandatory access controls define the resources an app is allowed to access. iOS offers very few IPC options compared to Android and uniform hardware integration creates a security advantage. The security architecture consists of hardware security, secure boot, code signing, sandbox, encryption, data protection, and general exploit mitigations. At the time of the uh, writing the course and book, every iOS device has two built-in AES 256-bit keys. These keys are included in the application processor and the secure enclave during manufacturing. There is no direct way to read these keys with software or debugging interfaces. The uh, one of the two keys, the group ID value is shared by all processors in a class of devices that is used to prevent tampering with firmware files. The UID is unique to each device and is used to protect the key hierarchy that is then used for things like device level file system encryption. UIDs are not created during manufacturing 
And uh, according to everybody, not even Apple can restore the file encryption keys for a device. The Apple Secure Boot Chain consists of the kernel, the bootloader, the kernel extensions, and the baseband firmware. Apple has an elaborate DRM system to ensure only Apple approved code runs on Apple devices. The Fair Play Code Encryption, that's funny named, is applied to apps downloaded from the App Store. The app sandbox is enforced at the kernel level and has been a core security feature since the first release of iOS. All third-party applications run under the same user, the user is called mobile, and only few system applications and services run as root. Regular applications are confined to a container that restricts access to the app's own files and very limited number of system API calls. Access to all resources is controlled by the sandbox and iOS implements the address space layout randomization and the execute never bit to mitigate any code execution attacks. Now, this is not to say that Apple devices are superior to Android. It just means that because Apple devices are essentially the same, it's easier for Apple to, to implement security measures and have them go widespread to all the devices versus Android, who the foundation is one thing, but not every manufacturer, not every uh, reseller keeps all their phones up to date. So you do have a mishmash of Android versions in the wild versus iOS, not so much. Pros and cons to both. And again, if you want to get into mobile, if this, if this little glimpse is catching your interest, I would suggest looking more into it. There's a whole world when it comes to Android and iOS security. To wrap things up, we have physical security. Any attacker that has physical access to their target already has an advantage. So physical security, like locked doors, man traps, fences, all that stuff is important. It's critical. Because once that attacker is in front of that machine, well, they can pretty much do anything. There is the cold boot attack pictured here. A side channel attack in which an attacker tries to retrieve encryption keys from a running operating system after a cold reboot. It is possible to grab that information um, while it's still in memory and it hasn't been wiped by the system and then be able to get things like passwords and, and other critical information and run with it. There are ways to do console debugging, reconnaissance or tampering. A lot of serial devices like routers don't require authentication when connecting to the serial port and instead assume that if you're physically connected to the serial port, you should have had access to the door to get in, to everything else that leads up to it. So it should be fine. But again, that's not to, that you should not assume that. So like I said, having physical security to fight against things like piggybacking or tailgating, fence jumping, dumpster diving, lock picking, tampering with sensors, badge cloning. All of those things should come first or in parallel 
when talking about how do we secure the, the local machines, the end devices that our users will have access to, that our users will interface with the rest of the network. Don't just put all your focus into physical security and forget to secure the machines themselves or vice versa. Spend all your time implementing group policy, implementing secure communications, uh, implementing uh, all the things that we talked about and then forgetting to have a way to ensure that the doors are locked. Again, the physical and the digital world are one. You really should treat them as such. Treat them as one and the same. So when you're doing your pen test and it's a on-site pen test, think about both the physical security and the digital. Because it's not, it's not just one or the other. The work for this week is more Try Hack Me Rooms. It is doing five rooms in Try Hack Me that relate to exploiting host vulnerabilities. So find five rooms of your uh, desire that meet that topic, complete them, and submit proof. And as always, if you have any questions, if you're falling behind, please ask away on Discord. It is always encouraged in my classes